The Unshackled Waves, episode 101. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have you company. Australian politics is still in a state of crisis. We will discuss that and more with front and centre host Emilio Garcia, who is filling in for Jacob Watts today. This is the Unshackled Waves Review Show. Emilio, welcome to the Review Show. Ah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it will be quite a uh, different experience from the last time you are on the, the show, but it will give us a chance to uh, explore um, some topics maybe that uh, we haven't before and yeah, f- uh, learn about each other better. Absolutely. I'm, I'm down for it. Let's go. Now, the main story in Australian politics continues to be the uh, citizenship crisis. Now, it's actually being referred to as a constitutional uh, crisis, and even uh, Wikipedia puts it on par with uh, Australia's uh, constitutional crisis in 1975, which culminated with the Governor-General dismissing Prime Minister Gough Whitlam. So the latest is we have uh, John Alexander, who is the Liberal MP for Benelong, which is a, most people believe is a marginal seat. He was uh, suspected to have uh, British citizenship by descent on on the fact that his father was uh, born in Britain, Albert, all the way back in 1907. So he's decided to uh, resign. We're not 100% sure whether it's confirmed he is a British uh, citizen, but uh, if he is, that makes him uneligible under Section 44 of the Constitution because the High Court found that citizenship by descent is counted as dual citizenship and ignorance is uh, no excuse. Uh, the the questions are now continuing about a num- number of other MPs. Every day there's a new MP who uh, questions are raised about their citizenship status. And uh, Turnbull and Shorten disagree on a disclosure requirement for all MPs. Turnbull wants it to be uh, all MPs to uh, disclose documentation within 21 days. Shorten wants it to be five days. So there's this standoff between the two leaders. And... It's we we don't know where it's going to go next because it's it's get, if in the mind of most people it's be, it's it's beyond just uh, you know a political storm like there this is a real problem for uh, you know, uh, Australia's governance. Well, absolutely, because what you have is, is it's not a it's not a war issue. We have, and the reason that it's being called a crisis is because it's absolutely a crisis. What? issue do we tackle first? Do we tackle the issue that we have a bunch of people in our government who are in your government, rather probably not my government, that uh, got in through false pretenses, whether it was uh, whether they were aware that they were not qualified to be uh, in the position or not. And then we have to look at the other side to how we resolve this. And that's one of the more complicated issues, I think. So what are we going to do? Are we going to allow people that have uh, dual citizenship to continue to do their work, especially in a, in a culture as diverse as Australia's. It's not a, a stretch of the imagination to think that people have um, sort of uh, varied backgrounds. And on the other hand, we're saying, are we just going to pardon the fact that these people got into governance uh, fa- through false pretenses, uh, basically lying to their constituents and to the government that they work for, uh, and now hold that uh, that coveted position? So absolutely, it's a, it's a big crisis, and uh, there there's no real uh, there's no real easy solution. The government can't uh, p- pardon these MPs because under the the constitution, uh, if you're a dual citizen, you're automatically ineligible. So there's nothing that the government or the opposition can do about that. If uh, if an MP is a dual citizen, then they're out. That's the Law, law of the land. What my, my point was going to be is, uh, since it is a constitutional crisis and there probably has to be some legislative uh, solution, uh, what is our best move? Is it to move towards the status quo of getting all the people that were already in the government hours kind of sticking to what um, what the constitution says? Or are we going to change that? Are we going to let people uh, that have dual citizenship 
uh, start to start to uh, hold office. I think maybe uh, the second one is kind of a more pragmatic approach because uh, I think maybe Australia today is a very different country than it was um, some years ago, especially when the constitution was written. And right now it's not a complete stretch of the imagination to think that people that are in government have a uh, very backgrounds. So that's what I meant. Not so much that it's kind of like a presidential pardon. It's like, are we going to change the rules to allow people that don't necessarily have the qualifications today to have the qualifications tomorrow. Well, when the Constitution was written in 1901, Australian citizenship didn't actually exist. That didn't come into effect until uh, 1948, okay. which it's been highlighted that uh, most of these people getting knocked out are uh, British uh, citizens uh, by, uh, by descent. Uh, and so I I've made the point maybe we should just abolish uh, Australian citizenship, and we were all revert back to being uh, British <laughs> subjects. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, that, that's probably not the most pragmatic approach, but yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, something has to be done. Uh, and again, what what are we going to do, and how is it going to play to our, to the constituents, to these people's constituents, and to the government um, as a whole, if we just decide to allow these people who either blatantly lied or were ignorant to the legislative um, sort of underpinnings of this to remain in office. But then again, how is it going to affect the government to just kind of cleanse all these people, which apparently are a lot, and replace them with people that are just completely 100% Australian? Uh, both sides seem like uh, pretty complicated solutions. What the public wants here is, that, is they want anyone who's a dual citizen uh, out of the parliament. The the view of the public is, you know, we're all meant to follow the, the laws, so, you know, our politicians should be able to comply with our most basic law, with, which is the constitution. That's why there's been this pressure for uh, an audit of MP citizenship, so we can, you know, clear this up once and for all, because it's, the High Court is now clear that uh, citizenship by descent is, counts as dual citizenship and ignorance is, is no excuse. And it's, and the, the reason why um, both Malcolm Turnbull and Bill Shorten have been resisting is because they know they'll lose a whole bunch of uh, MPs. But it's, right. it's clear from the, the view of the public now that if it does bring down the government, then we're, we're, uh, they're prepared for another election to make sure that we have a parliament that is, uh, is properly elected with you know, people who are eligible to be there. Right. Yeah. And uh, I mean, obviously, obviously, uh, we, we would need uh, our politicians to have more integrity for them to say, let's do what's right, uh, despite the fact that it's going to be a complicated transition and we might lose seats and, you know, other parties might gain more power. Uh, I don't think that that's something that we can that we can uh, expect from our politicians anytime soon, unless the, the, the pressure is enormous. Uh, will they work against their interests? Uh, for now, I think that, that the, the solutions are not going to be um, that simple. Uh, momentum is growing for a snap election to be held. I've, I've noticed a lot of um, chatter on social media and also by co commentators that the only way to uh, basically in restore integrity to the parliament is, is for a fresh election. But you'd also have to make sure that the new parliament is complying with the, the constitution. So there'll definitely have, have to be some sort of a vetting process before a person nominates for the uh, House of Representatives or the Senate, because at the moment it just you know you get your nomination form and you know you say you know you tick a box saying you know I am you know complying with the Constitution and then that's it, which seems conveniently uh, simple. Uh, and another thing is that it's not really that simple, right, to check a person's uh, a, a person's citizenship. It's not it's not like a credit report. Uh, I don't think you know. Uh, there, there's a long, li a long list of uh, of people each country has of who's who's their citizen. I mean, so that's another complicated issue. Like, how are we going to make sure that the people in the future are actually not dual citizenships? I mean, uh, dual citizens rather. Uh, how it, it's really a complicated issue because it's not it's not something that you can check uh, check a background for. So it, it's and, uh, we might we might be headed towards a snap election, but not necessarily without these same issues. Yeah, it's a two-step solution. Like we've we've got to find a way to, uh, you know, vet uh, 
MP, uh, people before they're elected to parliament, and you know, with the current lot, if there's if there's right. you know twenty or thirty more that are found to be uh, dual citizens, and we need you know, twenty more uh, by-elections, then yes, that's that's when we do need a a gen general election to make sure that the the integrity is back into parliament. And it's interesting that. The, the Greens, who most people have uh, said uh, are the party that have come out of this uh, crisis with the, the most integrity, uh, because you know their uh, senators who were dual citizens uh, resigned immediately. They were the, one of the first parties to call for an audit. Uh, their uh, proposal is quite extreme. They want to see if they can ask the, the Governor General to uh, dissolve Parliament and call a new election, which would be an unprecedented step because the Governor General acts on the advice of the, the Prime Minister, never acts uh, unilaterally. And we, we only saw that happen one time, which was again in 1975. Right. Uh, I guess we would think um, how serious a problem is this and does it merit such an extreme solution? I don't think so. I think that there are far better solutions that can be taken up. I, I, I would think that one of the things we could do is just to kind of, uh, kind of look into uh, the sitting MPs at the moment and bet them um, one by one, and then get the ones that shouldn't be there uh, out, and then maybe maybe hold elections for for those MPs particularly. However, uh, it it seems it seems a very uh, rash solution to just uh, you know dissolve the whole government, uh, and then have uh, a brand new election. It just seems like one of those things that uh, is a pretty extreme solution to an issue which is pretty big, but not quite that big. Well, one one thing's for sure is that. Uh, the public, they they want the politicians to just agree, uh, agree to you know compel MPs to provide documentation, and if it means that a whole bunch of you know MPs of your MPs get knocked out, then so be it. Just you know resolve this this process. I think I th I think that's what the public is after. And I think they're right to be after it, and I think we have to look for a modest and efficient solution as, as opposed to a very extreme uh, sort of crisis solution. There was a lot of outrage this week when uh, nationalist group Patriot Blue, which was uh, founded by um, longtime uh, Patriot activist uh, Neil Erickson, they uh, decided to go up to Sam Dastiari in a restaurant in Melbourne and uh, uh, dish out a lot of abuse to him. They called him a monkey terrorist. Uh, told him to you know, go back to Iran. It was, you know, it's the, uh, it was it was pretty you know intense uh, uh, stuff. Uh, the media, uh, politicians, and even some conservative commentators condemned it, saying it was, you know, an ugly uh, I incident. Now, obviously, uh, like yeah, going up to a politician and you know yelling abuse at them is not the the nicest thing to do. But the position that I, that I took was it's still more more civil than uh, what left wing activists do because. They've, what happened is there Neil Erickson and there was two others with him. Like they, they didn't obstruct, you know, Sam Dastyari's movement at all. If you watch the videos, which um, they've been deleted from Facebook now, uh, you know, Sam Dastyari is able to order his drink, go over and, you know, uh, sit down. They stay for about five minutes and and then leaves. And you know, security doesn't need to be called or anything. They just have their say and and go. Right. Um, well, I think uh, two things that have to be addressed there is that, uh, first of all, when it comes to, uh, to protests and confrontations, obviously, they're, they're very different. Uh, here, that, that, that was more of a confrontation. That wasn't um, an organized, enormous group of people going to, uh, to kind of protest a, a movement or a happening. It was just a couple of people kind of finding this guy at a Melbourne restaurant and uh, yelling things that were pretty, pretty outrageous, uh, which I think anyone would be good to, um, to condemn. Uh, however, the the one thing that we have on the right, which we don't have, which we uh, on the rather what we have on the left, which we don't have on the right, is, is sort of the culture of punch a Nazi, right? Where any time that someone we disagree with is um, is present, we're just going to label him a Nazi, which gives us the the right to go ahead and inflict violence on them, which um, which the right has the moral high ground on. We, if, they, if they just don't don't feel it's um, necessary to uh, to inflict violence on someone who they disagree with. However, what they did was completely unacceptable, and I think that uh, that even though we see uh, a lot more physical um, 
altercations on the left, it doesn't mean that we should say, well, that's why it's okay, or that's why it's less bad. I mean, it's pretty, pretty shady on its own merit. Uh, I think sometimes the left deserve a bit, a bit back, and uh, you know that, that's how I interpreted the the incident. Uh, and, and it's interesting that the left, you know, they dish out so much, but you know, as soon as one of their own is, you know, put in in a slightly uncomfortable position, they completely lose their shit, and they're like, oh, you know, like Nazis are on the streets of Melbourne now. Oh, you know, you can't even go to the the, the pub now without, you know, being harassed. Like, oh, this is, you know, such <laughs> the, the worst thing that ever happened. Right, right, right. Uh, I mean, that, that's another thing, I guess, uh, we, have to, we have to kind of take into consideration. Really, really kind of the, um, the doomsday scenario mindset that exists on both ends. And I think we have to see um, just how both ends react. Now, you have on the left a culture of um, sort of our feelings matter. And uh, we have the right to kind of fight for, uh, for our liberties and whatever. And they just have turned into this Antifa, SJW mindset where you can kind of go and... Um, and, and it kind of inflict violence. But what we see in terms of confrontations, we're not talking about um, about actual rioting or anything like that. When we're seeing uh, people on the left and people on the right kind of confronting one individual, they seem to be pretty similar. Uh, I mean, if you look at how, how college students have confronted um, people uh, high up in the, in the university because they let them wear whichever costumes they want, whatever, they don't seem to go up and punch them or anything like that. It seems to be kind of similar to the right, where they go and they scream, they don't let the other people speak, and, you know, they kind of launch these character um, attacks. And uh, so we're not that different in that sense. I will say that, that the left has kind of gone off the rails, and I think just because they've kind of uh, lost their shit after... Um, so much conservative uh, winning, but uh, but no, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that uh, that the left is unique in their uh, shady tactics when it comes to attacking people they don't like. I mean, look at what the Australian left has, has done this week alone. Uh, on uh, Melbourne Cup Day, uh, pro, uh, prote protesters who uh, are, are against the uh, closure of the Manus Island Detention Centre, they drove a car onto the Flemington uh, Racecourse railway line, uh, which takes people to, to the Melbourne Cup because, you know, in, in their words, they wanted to punish racegoers for their, you know, alleged uh, complicity in the, the government's actions. So basically, they're prepared to, you know, inconvenience thousands of uh, race goers to make a political point, which seems weird. Like uh, the the way to convince people is to inconvenience them to like punish them. That seems like a weird way to convince people. And then there was also a uh, another protest uh, of against Manus Island uh, at a uh, Liberal Party fundraiser for Tony Abbott and uh, Christine Forster, who's uh, Tony Abbott's sister, she was attacked on the way in and got a uh, jacket uh, ripped. Um, so that is just what the left has done uh, this, this, this week alone. I mean, they've aggressed you know, either physically or, you know, through inconveniencing people against the public. I mean, right. and there's there, there's not the same level of outrage as there was against the Sam Destiari incident. Right. No, no, no. And I mean, that, that's one of the things that, I, that I'm going to... Uh, right now we're talking about actual protests because what we saw, uh, what we were talking about earlier when this guy uh, was, was kind of confronted in, in uh, the Melbourne restaurant, that wasn't a protest, right? And so when it comes to uh, left-wing protests and right-wing protests, I absolutely will concede that they are far more violent and their their tactics their tactics are far more um, incendiary and far more um, and they have just far more more uh, implications for the public. And again, as you say, like why would they inconvenience the public? How is that any way to bring them onto their side? Well, that's why they can't win a fucking election. I mean, that's why uh, we see kind of like this takeover of either um, center right or right. Uh, however, uh, we we do see some protests on the right, which even though they are not violent and they're not kind of creating this enormous inconvenience for people, uh, still are pretty pretty. Um, they're pretty incendiary. They're pretty uh, bad in in what they're preaching. And so, even though we see some very bad tactics on the left, I don't think that we should kind of take that to say the left is the only one that's that's taking on some shady uh, tactics when it comes to voicing their opinion in a group. Well, uh, there, there obviously have been, you know, right-wing protests that have, you know, got, gone off the rails. But I do think when it comes to, uh, you know, protests 
causing public disturbances. It's clearly uh, a leftist problem. Like I've like in in Australia at least, it's it's always been that the police need to restrain uh, leftist protesters. Like when whenever the left and right. Uh, in the same place, the the police are always facing and trying to hold back the the left. That's where all the aggression comes from. And another development this week was that uh, Sydney University they want to charge conservative groups uh, security fees for for their events because the left always come and uh, protest it. One, the Sydney University. Uh, conservative club, they wanted to hold uh, an event uh, talking about the future of coal and they were told they needed security for it. Apparently the left there, they're triggered by even the discussion of coal. It, well, uh, one thing that I'd be careful though, which, which, I, which I like to say, is that we need to, we need to draw a clear distinction between the left and the leftists. So the left is, you know, just a political uh, ideology which lies on this end, and then you have the leftists, which are kind of like the crazy Antifa SJW people who uh, kind of just get triggered over everything. So that's the first thing I would say. Uh, the second thing I would say is uh, absolutely just the the level of um, triggeredness of the left and the the ability to just decide that anything that isn't left wing is is uh, hate speech or violence is off the rails, and that's something that completely has to be addressed. Uh, when it comes to Sydney uh, Uni saying that they have to um, charge, charge conservative groups uh, fees for uh, for their protection, I'm wondering what it was. Is this basically Sydney Uni say, trying to get less conservative people to speak on their campus, or are they just being pragmatic about the fact that uh, people are going to come protest, kind of try to come and inflict violence on people that uh, they're not, uh, they're, they're conservative, and thus we need to cover their expenses, and we're not going to do it out of pocket, so they have to do it. Obviously, both of those are, uh, are kind of uh, shady, but I mean, that's, that's kind of like the world we live in. The fact of the matter is, if you have a conservative speaking on any subject, probably you're going to have some Antifas there, you know, ready to crack some skulls. No, but that doesn't mean you should basically, you know, charge the victim. Like, oh, you're about to be uh, aggressed upon, so we're going to like stick you with the with the, with the bill, so you you don't get attacked. Yeah, no, it, it, no, it's ridiculous. It's completely ridiculous. And uh, and if you know, even if you see what happened in Berkeley with this uh, conservative American called Ben Shapiro, um, Berkeley, you know, uh, said we're gonna we're, we have to we have to basically let this guy speak. That's what this university is about, and so they took on a bill of six hundred thousand dollars just to make sure that you know the Antifas and the SJWs weren't able to go in and you know just basically start attacking any conservative in sight. Um, so it, would that be the proper solution? And can Sydney University afford to to uh, protect the speakers? Absolutely. So um, that's why I was saying that both sides of the coin are shady. Whether it's that they're trying to suppress. Uh, conservative speakers from coming, or whether they're just trying to not pay out of pocket to protect conservatives, both sides are completely, completely shady, and obviously Sydney Uni uh, should not be taking on that tactic. Sex scandals have been exposed in multiple settings the, the past uh, few weeks. It started in Hollywood with the uh, f uh, revelation that uh, Hollywood film producer Harvey Weinstein uh, had uh, harassed, uh, uh, assaulted um, uh, multiple uh, women, and it's had a knock-on effect now. Uh, the, the next star to fall was uh, uh, Kevin Spacey, who had been uh, accused of uh, inappropriate uh, contact with uh, minors, and then just in the past uh, 24 hours, George uh, Taki was the the latest uh, to to be accused. And there's been other uh, actors, producers, directors who've had uh, allegations of uh, sexual misconduct uh, le uh, leveled against them. And it's, so it's really been a a, no a knock on effect. And it's interesting right. to note that uh, you know institutional uh, sexual abuse it's 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 just not confined to like say the Catholic Church or uh, you know other religious institution it's a society you know wide problem and Hollywood has been you know the the latest to have been exposed right uh, I mean it's it's clearly a, a huge rampant issue uh, in in many places obviously we saw um, a few years ago in Fox News, uh, all these all these settlements to women. Then we saw even at NPR all these issues uh, with with women having to be to be given settlements and people being fired for um, sexual misconduct. 
uh, when it comes to Kevin Spacey, I think one of the things, and I, I spoke about this on my podcast, one of the things that was so shady about what Kevin Spacey did is basically uh, say that he didn't remember, but he assumed that he did it, which probably means that he's kind of a creep. I mean, if you're saying that, you know, you had no idea, you were drunk out of your mind, but that sounds like you, I mean, what the fuck? I mean, that's, that's pretty shady on its own merit, right? Uh, and then he said, oh, but it's all cool because I'm gay. Which, again, it's, um, and I think this is, this is one of the things that, that gay, gay activists were so upset about. It's like, so what if you're gay? I mean, is that some kind of previous condition that makes you climb on top of boys? That's messed up. Yeah. So that was um, shady on its own merit. And um, nobody bought that sorry, you um, excuse that, you know, like, that, oh, it was mainly called a deflection when he, you know, said, like, oh, I choose to live as a gay man. Like, no, and nobody bought that. Like, nobody, you know, left or right uh, uh, bought it. And I, I don't see, if, speaking of that, see it as uh, this political. I know some conservative, uh, you know, commentators have said that, oh, you know, look at... Um, you know, Hollywood, you know, always trying to take the moral high ground, but they're covering up all this uh, sexual abuse. But as you mentioned before, like, just look at what's been happening at, you know, Fox News. I mean, this isn't a political issue. This is a moral issue. Mm-hmm. No, it's a moral issue, and it's rampant, and uh, I mean, what, 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 what the hell are we going to do about it um, is not really clear. But uh, it's clearly not one of those things that we can just go, uh, you know, uh, institution by institution or case by case. There, pl- there clearly has to be some kind of um, societal uh, turnaround. Um, that isn't, though, to equate the fact that there uh, is sexual abuse kind of rampant in many areas to kind of like try to give vindication to um, these people that say that there's such a thing as a rape culture, which uh, obviously are two different things. And those two things are being equated right now. I don't know if you've been reading... Um, I like to look into like uh, the, the the feminist papers and everything, just to have a good laugh every once in a while. And uh, everyday feminism—I don't know if you've ever looked at that page, which is uh, pretty hilarious. Uh, they're basically saying this vindication for the fact that there's rape culture. That basically all men just think that it's uh, totally cool to go around uh, groping and raping women, which obviously is not. I think it it kind of has more to do with um, men in positions of power, uh, kind of taking advantage of that and maybe getting a little bit too ballsy and uh, and taking advantage of people that uh, maybe don't have the wherewithal. To, um, to fight back in a certain way. And if you see, another thing that's really important to take into consideration, especially with Harvey Weinstein and, and recently Louis C.K., which is such a bummer because he's so funny, is that it's not actually, what they're doing isn't rape, it's, it's, it's abuse. Um, but w- you, it, it's this strange um, kind of psychological uh, approach that they take, for example, just to kind of, you know, uh, diddling themselves in front of women, which, uh, which they just have no idea how to respond. Bond to these are people that uh, within their industry could you know completely destroy their careers and so so what you see is not that it's so much of a rape issue it's an issue of basically kind of flexing your muscles and showing you know that you're the big man with with all the power that can basically make this person who's um, not quite as evolved to you not quite as big as you uh, on the on the stage um, kind of just have to sit there and take it so I think that's a pretty pretty shady issue on on every political. Uh, political aisle and on uh, almost all companies. I mean, it's, 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 it's a huge problem. Uh, a feminist, they started the Me Too hashtag, which was, you know, they listed all the times, you know, they'd been, you know, sexually harassed or assaulted. And it's, uh, that, that appeared to be, uh, in my view, another excuse for, you know, feminists to, to whinge. But as you mentioned, like, you know, rape culture, it's supposed to say that there's, you know, this society-wide... Uh, problem and what it ends up being is rape culture picks on you know ordinary you know men just going about their business I mean just look at you know all the you know pa- uh, you know uh, powerful you know Hollywood women who had kept quiet about uh, Harvey uh, Weinstein and yet they they all come forward now it's clearly a you know a, a power issue uh, not not the, not the fact that because it's it's much more difficult to you know take on these people in you know higher places. Well, you know fe- feminists they always go for the easy target, which is you know the ordinary man, like you know a college uh, uh, student, you know accused of rape. You know he's you know just a you know ordinary person. Like he's easy to you know basically take down and crucify. Oh, and, and this is one of the things that uh, that is just so dangerous right now that um, that people are basically. Uh, First of all, there's there's this uh, cultural thing going around that women are being told basically uh, anything that happens to you, any any microaggression, almost 
uh, is rape. And you can basically go accuse these men of rape, especially on, on college campuses, and the college campus will consider a man guilty until he's proven innocent, and not even then. We have a case in the U.S. right now where this guy um, was accused wrongly of, of uh, sexual abuse. Uh, a camera video footage showed him in a different place completely uh, when the girl said that, that, that he raped her. And the police said, all right, stamp of approval, he's not guilty. And the university uh, investigated him for another six months, which is one of the, one of the, one of the more shady um, sides of this uh, kind of um, rape culture um, facade that, that is being thrown around. But on the other hand, what you have with uh, the actual culture of, um, of abuse and with Me Too and everything is that you're kind of equating two different things and you're making it really dangerous. You're not, you're not allowing society to understand what the problem really is yet by kind of cartoonifying it and making it just um, so just making it kind of something that anyone can put on their Twitter. And that means now that that's just one more person that you know that's been abused when we really don't know the story. And so that's actually really dangerous. The Me Too hashtag... Um, I understand that, that a lot of, you know, it, it kind of lets women maybe that have not been able to come forward yet kind of take the first step towards uh, towards accepting that this has happened and telling their family and friends, and I can understand that point of it. But on the other end, that we're, that we're basing such a huge um, societal impact on the fact that someone can write a hashtag on their Twitter or on their Facebook, it's really worrisome because because then you, you don't really know the impact or what happened or the backstory to that, that either it was a woman who was raped or a woman who, um, you know, like what happened with Harvey Weinstein that uh, he just, you know, stood in front of a door and masturbated. It's just such a dangerous precedent to just be kind of uh, pushing this to such an extreme and saying anyone who has ever had an unpleasant experience ever, hashtag me too, and then we're just going to say that everyone everyone who says me too has been raped. It, it just wasn't very uh, diltfully in, um, implemented. And of course, Hollywood uh, isn't the, the only institution which has uh, been rocked by sex scandals. We also saw uh, British uh, politics, uh, 36 uh, British MPs have been accused of uh, sexual misconduct. And again, this had been rumoured for years that um, you know, the, the powerful in Westminster had been um, engaging in rampant uh, sexual misconduct. And so, uh, so that's been... There's now going to be some sort of inquiry uh, that uh, Prime Minister Theresa May has announced, which is a, it's a really, um, you know, limp-wristed uh, response. And it makes you wonder with which institution will be next, because this is probably happening elsewhere. And it really makes you, you know, wonder, like, how can, you know, so many people know about, you know, what's really going on in in an institutional setting, and yet just, you know, keep quiet about it and, you know, pretend that, you know, nothing's wrong and not have it on their conscience. Uh, I mean, it's just incredibly worrisome, and especially, I mean, uh, just the silence, obviously, is, is a bigger issue here than in other circumstances. I mean, just, I mean, keeping quiet about, for example, people knowing that you, you should keep young boys away from Kevin Spacey because they knew that, that he was going to crawl up on them and all, all these different things is, is extremely worrisome. Uh, one thing that I saw that was extremely, extremely disturbing, and this happened on the right back in the U.S. recently, is that there's this judge uh, who right now is running for some kind of office or some kind of elected office, and several girls have come forward saying that when he was in his 30s and they were, you know, teenagers 14 to 11, that he, you know, um, did, you know, not that he, but that he, you know, uh, tried to make out with them, that he fondled them, that all these things. And conservative media came to his defense, and I thought that was so shady. Uh, Sean Hannity had to apologize because he said, uh, oh, well, it was consensual. It's fine. That's, that's very shady, too. And so what we see right now is kind of us um, trying to ignore the sex scandals of anyone who we like and trying to, um, to, to vindicate all the sex scandals on people that we dislike, right? So if it's Louis C.K. or if it's, you know, anyone, anyone on the left who we like, any comedians or any... Um, any actors that we like, we'll kind of give them the, the benefit of the doubt. And if you see the first few hours of Kevin Spacey's um, allegations were kind of covered by the fact that he was gay, probably liberal media trying to, uh, to appease the situation. Uh, and we're seeing the same thing in conservative circles. So I think that one of the bigger issues is the fact that we're taking um, all of these allegations and we're kind of molding them and we're treating them on a case-by-case -case basis based on what is best for us and what is going to benefit us, uh, whether it be um, political setting or just people that we like.
Yep, cool. That'll do for that segment. So next one is Trump's election anniversary. It was the one year anniversary of Donald Trump's election as president of the United States and the left decided to be uh, triggered all over again. There was the beginning of the refuse uh, fascism uh, movement, which was basically the same sort of you know, leftist uh, anti for Black Lives Matter protests we've come to expect complaining about you know, uh, racism and how we need to embrace intersectionality. And then there was, I initially thought it was a joke, but the scream helplessly at the, the sky, which uh, uh, this woman uh, did famously on Inauguration Day. Apparently that was uh, a legitimate thing. Which, like, don't they understand that that just makes you look uh, ridiculous? So it's clear one year on that the left has learnt nothing and are still continuing on with their you know, uh, immature behaviour. Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the funniest things I've seen. Like, when I watched it also, like, I thought they had kind of compiled different people yelling at the staff for different reasons. When I figured out that it was an organized movement, not only that, but they, they were basing it on one of the most cartoonish uh, <laughs> depictions of, you know, this this woman or this guy, I don't, I don't really know who it was, that yelled when he when, when Trump became president, which is basically kind of like the, the icon of the triggered leftist who just could not deal with the fact that Donald Trump was president. I just could not believe that they were taking that symbol on and kind of using it to represent themselves. And this is supposed to show why they're not winning elections anymore. They're just not winning elections anymore because they think everything that everyone hates about them, they're grabbing, they're holding on to it, and they're, they're kind of squeezing it to their chest. And anything that people do like about the left and anything that has to do politically with the left that people would like, they're ignoring. It's all about, you know, being tr triggered and hashtags and, you know, I, I always say it's just, it's just kind of one of those ridiculous things. That's why they're, um, they're just so inefficient uh, in, in kind of recruitment so far. Well, there were um, a few elections because uh, the first uh, Tuesday of November in the United States is uh, Election Day, and the governorships of New Jersey and Virginia went dem Democratic, which the uh, media claimed was uh, because the anti-Trump movement uh, was energised and they went out and campaigned for these uh, you know, uh, Democratic uh, nominees, uh, but it should be noted that both of these states are traditionally blue states. I mean, they both uh, voted for, for Hillary Clinton in, in last year's election. I mean, you really can't uh, see too much in, in, into these results, but of course, you know, the media, they love uh, any opportunity to uh, take a, a, whack at, a whack at Trump, but, you know, we won't see, you know, what, what the real yeah. state of uh, Trump's popularity is until uh, the midterms next year when most governorships are up for election. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's one of the things I just thought was so ridiculous. People were just like so excited because, you know, we took back these two governorships, which, you know, from states that are really blue and that, you know, voted mostly for uh, what's called mo most uh, localities voted overwhelmingly for Hillary Clinton. And um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't think that this is vindication for, for, um, for Democrats or for the Democratic Party. Um, and I don't think, you know, one of the things that, that Trump might have contributed to is that the Democratic Party needed to step up its game and realize that, you know, just the fact of being Democrats or just the fact of not being Trump is not enough anymore, which is kind of like what they ran on in 2016, which was such a catastrophic disaster. They kind of realized that, you know, they're, they're, that we kind of have to step up our game. So that might have contributed in some way, shape or form. Uh, but what we do know about about uh, Trump's, uh, Trump's popularity is at least what polling, scientific polling tells us, is that it's extremely low. So um, I think that, that that even though these two elections don't tell us it, or weren't just necessarily a uh, backlash against Trump, that Trump is completely in the clear right now is um, is absolutely not true. I mean, if you see uh, his polling numbers right now are the lowest in seven decades of polling uh, for a president uh, 10 months in. So uh, not that not that the, the elections were um, a referendum on Trump, but to say Trump's in the clear, I wouldn't go that far. Well, the Democratic Party itself, I mean, its approval ratings are still not very high. I mean, uh, po politicians, you know, Washington is not popular with the voters, period. I mean, Congress has an incredibly low uh, approval rating. So uh, I've, I don't think that the Democrats can claim they're, you know, riding high. 
Oh, absolutely not. No, no, no. Right now, I mean, it's it's kind of a strange situation where um, both sides of the aisle is completely unpo unpopular, and you know, they're just fighting with each other to see who can become less unpopular. And um, I mean, that, that's a, what, what what a situation we're in right now, right? The most powerful country in the world, basically just playing kind of a pissing contest to see who can be less hated than the other guy. It's a, it's a shame. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, relevant to the election, and uh, you know, relevant to one to kind of attack for anything. It's just get, it's just getting completely out of hand. I mean, the, the, a reputable news source like CNN, MSNBC, uh, or um, NPR, all these all these institutions that were so important to uh, to the American uh, identity uh, for so many years would kind of take on these uh, wild interpretations is just uh, absurd. And uh, as the uh, one-year anniversary passed us by, Donald Trump wasn't actually in the United States. He was on a uh, tour of Asia, where uh, I, I thought he was, you know, being quite, you know, diplomatic with the uh, Prime Minister of Japan. He made a good speech to the South Korean Parliament. But of course, and th and this is why, you know, the mainstream media is, you know. Trust in it is being constantly eroded because they're still picking at things that he did. Like, for example, they accused him of uh, killing fish in Japan when he was feeding the fish uh, in a pond with the Japanese prime minister, and said that oh, he dumped his uh, all, all the all the fish food into into the, uh, the the pond, which was not actually correct. It was just the the camera angle that made it appear like that. Yeah. That was one of the. That was among one of the shadier things that I've seen from CNN so far. Because I've always said that I'm very skeptical to call CNN fake news because you can't just call anything you don't like fake news. You know, it's it's sometimes the reporting is correct, biased. But if you see what CNN did was basically zoom in to Trump right when Shinzo Abe throws his whole whole dude in, front. and then kind of Trump, you know, looks to the guy, you know, who's who knows how to do this. Thing and then pours it in. The headline reads, Trump gets impatient and throws fish or whatever. That's fake news. I mean, that's one of the things, like, you know, you can be misleading, you can be biased, but when you're flat out lying, that is, that's fake news. And that's, and I just thought it was so, and it's such a cheap shot. I mean, if you're actually going to lie to millions of people with such an easily, verifi easily verifiable um, occurrence, at least make it good. I mean, at least make it something that's going to, that's going to, you know, get people upset. I mean, the fact that Trump threw fish food into the food, I mean, did we hear him say that he grabbed a pussy uh, some months ago? Like, this is not a big deal. So yeah, I thought that, I thought that was just, um, that was just ridiculous. Yeah, and even some other mainstream media outlets, like, they, they had to, you know, report, look, you know, this is not true, but he, he didn't, you know, dump, uh, dump the fish uh, food in the in the lake, and so they, you know, at least at least they had some uh, integrity to, you know, correct what, what was clearly a misleading story. Absolutely, absolutely. And if you see what Trump has been doing in um, in Asia, I mean, if it, it kind of plays very well to what the what the left would want of him. You know, he he went. He was extremely diplomatic in um, in Japan. He was extremely diplomatic in Korea. And uh, I think that if anyone should be upset, it should be his base. You know, you know. I remember in 2016 when Trump said that China was raping our country, <laughs> and then you know, right now he's like, oh, we're best friends. You know, we need to be even closer. And you know, we love China. So. I, again, it's it's just such such a um, predisposition to hate Trump for being Trump, and he can never do anything. I mean, he could decide to become a Democrat and become pro-choice, and you know, do everything that the Democrats want, and they would just still completely um, bash him for anything. And it just just shows such a lack of objectivity uh, in the mainstream media world. Uh, both, I mean, even, even Fox News, which is sort of mainstream, it's just you know, they 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 will basically praise anything Trump does, even if it's bad and. It's just so worrisome. Well, let's have a look at uh, Trump one year on. I mean, contrary to the hysteria, America has not fallen apart. In fact, the economy is uh, improved, you know, jobs are being created. However, Trump, he does still need to fulfill key election promises. Uh, the Obamacare repeal, uh, you know, let's be honest about that, that's been a disaster. Um, the wall is, uh, building hasn't commenced on it. So he's still got uh, a lot of work to do. Absolutely. I mean, if you see if you see Trump, um, I mean, and one of the, one of his biggest issues is his tweeting and his uh, his just uh, lack of ability to stay on message. That just leads lawmakers and le you know it kind of shifts public opinion, so it does not allow people in Congress to kind of vote in his favor. First of all, when it comes to the wall, 
apparently they're going to start building it. They already have some prototypes going up, but it's not going to be paid by Mexico. That that's one of the things that's just like completely, um, completely off the table. And if you actually see, I don't know if you if you read the transcript the transcripts between Trump and uh, Peña Nieto, the the president of Mexico, that he was on the phone. He's like, oh, listen, what? Whatever, you just be saying that anywhere. Really, I don't care about it, but politically, it's very important. Clearly, the people that are going to pay for the wall are are the American taxpayers. So, uh, you know, that's even if it gets built, I think it's it's a pretty pretty, pretty big um, flop. Either way, uh, the repeal of Obamacare has been absolutely disastrous, and uh, I think one of the reasons is is the cons- uh, Republicans were just basically, you know running on this for years and years and years and saying it was such a disaster and we need to get rid of it the first day that it comes in. And then they win. I think they didn't expect to, to win. They're like, holy shit, I mean, what are we going to do? We need to work really fast. They didn't really put together a very well thought out plan uh, either of the three times. And it has just been a um, an absolute disaster. And, you know, Trump has really done very little. And even the, tra- the travel ban, I mean, he, he did his best. And, you know, even on a third attempt, some other uh, judge, I think, I think this time it was in Hawaii, blocked it once again. So... Trump is not is not doing well politically. I mean, he really needs that legislative win. Well, Emilio, thank you for uh, filling in today. It's been a, a great discussion. And, yeah, we'll definitely have you back on the show again sometime soon, I hope. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Don't forget our two upcoming live streams. The first is on Wednesday, the 15th of November, when the Marriage Law Postal Survey results are being released. The second one is on Queensland election night on Saturday the 25th of November. So I hope you can join us for our analysis of those results and I'll leave links to the event pages in the description. Thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.